Well, mo most of the vineyards in Missouri are owned by the winery, owned by the family. Um, so, you know, when you're growing a grape and you own the winery, you're gonna really watch your quality in the vineyard. Our climate and our soils and everything about our particular area where we are located makes these grapes great. Missouri overall wants to make the best wines they can. Um, we, we have stiff competition, you know, but uh, Missouri wines, the quality is there, but it's different. It's, uh, they're different. We have deep soils. We have high water retention in the soils. We um, do not have conditions that uh, lead us to need to use a lot of insecticides. We do not need to use uh, a lot of fertilizers. We can grow quite naturally here. There are 130 wineries here. We're making over a, a, a million gallons of wine a year state, statewide, and it's all selling. So it can't be bad if people are buying, and people are buying these things. But prohibi prohibition obviously just killed the economy. People don't really realize the, uh, the ferocity that the government came in to destroy alcohol, alcohol making equipment, farmlands, everything. It was a complete and utter devastation of the wine industry here. Um, and it really put Missouri back for decades. Yeah, the machines were scrapped, sold for scrap. Uh, a lot of the workers that were in the beer, wine, spirit industry in, in the Herman area, they said their families up and moved to St. Louis or Kansas City or bigger, bigger areas looking for work. The only thing that was left were the buildings. Prohibition messed up everything and it was a failure. As Missouri wines, as the American industry was growing in the in the 1800s, wines like Norton were were being sent to Europe and winning awards in competitions. Norton in Europe was beating wines of other parts of Europe. So the Europeans were tasting these wines, and this was a grape they'd never heard of. They said, "We should see how this grape does in our soil." So let's let's get some Norton grapevines from essentially Missouri grapevines take them over there and they, they put in Norton and over a period of years Norton was very successful but along with Norton came phylloxera when when, when you when you take these these plants out of the ground because phylloxera is a it's not quite microscopic but it's it's teeny teeny little bug but they'll, they eat through the rootstock and they live in the dirt so there's no way there's nothing you can do to stop it the vineyards became devastated they, 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 were, they were all the vineyards were dying in Europe and it was people like Dr. Hussman who came up with the idea, what if we take Missouri roots and graft Cabernet onto a Missouri root? So you, so you, take, a, you take a Norton grapevine, you cut off the top, and you take a Cabernet vine or a Pinot Noir vine or a Riesling vine and graft it on so that the phylloxera, which is in the dirt, is, is exposed to Missouri phylloxera resistant rootstock. But then, then the, 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 these great minds of, of these, these agriculture people in, in, in the Midwest, mostly Midwest at the time, said, okay, why don't we have the problem? Then they came up with the idea, well, why don't we do like that? And... My friends, if you bring back beer, you'll bring back the bar. If you bring back the bar, you will have the saloon. With the bar lined with the boys and bums, spending their money, debauching their characters, rotting their bodies, and jeopardizing their immortal souls. Stealing the roses from the cheeks and the virtue from the hearts of our daughters, disappointing the hopes of our fathers, breaking the hearts of our mothers, destroying our homes,
corrupting our politics, making cowards of our policemen and perjurers, of our public officers, and smiting with the leprous of perdition the gate of every city and the foundation of every state. The, the prohibition was the uh, 18th Amendment. They, they had to pass the Volstead Act to implement the 18th Amendment. The, 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 the amendment was passed, okay, no more alcohol. Well, now how do we enforce it? So they had to come up with this way. And that's when they, they came through, every, everywhere in the country, breweries, distilleries, wineries, came through and with their axes and sledgehammers and just broke up barrels every, everywhere they could. Talking to the old timers in Herman, um, this Herman was an enormous uh, production center before Prohibition, and they, they said this, the streets, just all the gutters were just full of wine, just running down the river. You know, they, they, they're, most of the vitamins are on hills, and you're, you're, you're breaking up these, these barrels and bottles, and the wine's just running down the, just like when it's raining, it's running down the sides of the streets and eventually into the, into the river. And it didn't matter the ecological damage that they did by dumping approximately three million gallons of wine into the Missouri River all on the same day. And the fish that died, the, the permanent damage they did, it didn't, it didn't matter to them. They were getting rid of an evil that they, they thought existed on the, on the planet. They pulled all the vineyards up. Uh, just in the Herman area alone, it was estimated just in the Herman area, there was well over 10,000 acres of grapes and all, nearly all of them were uprooted. Destroying all the winemaking equipment, destroying the fields, all the technology was lost. It, it literally brought the entire industry just down to nothing. One of my favorite parts about Prohibition is reminding people that Prohibition came about because of the way men treated their wives. It, suffrage was the, was a movement that, that really kicked Prohibition. You know, guys would get their paycheck, they'd go to the bar, they'd come home drunk. Wives just got tired of it. So you had people like Carrie Nation in Kansas. The, the, these, these, these groups would go in, they'd just start breaking up bars. They'd come in with, you know, hammers and hatchets and they'd just start tearing up bars and breaking bottles, the, 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 like wives. And, our, and, and then they became more organized. And, and when, they, when they realized the political power that they were getting, they decided, we need to vote. Missouri was unfortunately saddled between the Women's Christian Temperance Union Movement, which was up in Chicago, and the uh, Southern Baptists who wanted alcohol um, prevented. There's large Southern Baptist churches all, all around us. Between those two forces, there was no way that, that these wineries were going to survive. Families, you know, farmers, just, I mean, these were just families. These, you know, these weren't criminals. These, the, what, what we did with prohibition was make it a crime. That's where uh, you know, organized crime came from prohibition because you, you tell people they can't have something, they're going to find a way to get it. Uh, a lot of the workers that were in the beer, wine, spirit industry, in, in the Herman area, they said their families up and moved to St. Louis or Kansas City or bigger bigger areas looking for work. So we, we, you know, we had a, there was an American wine culture until Prohibition and then we lost it. Uh, we lost all of our bartenders, all the great bartenders went to Europe. So there was, so, so there, there was, there was nothing. You know, the, the cocktail was an American invention and, and the, the great books of cocktail recipes and the, and the stories of how these things operate. These these people had no career, so they went they went to Europe where they could get work. But there can be no possible misunderstanding. Let me read the provisions of the Democratic platform on this point, and let me add that it's in plain English. It begins, we advocate the repeal of the 18th Amendment. When prohibition was repealed in 1933 in the state of Missouri, 
The problem that really existed was the economic depression had occurred and there was no capital available to buy presses, buy fruits, restart businesses. When prohibition ended, uh, the high alcohol, high proof wines were the ones that became instantly popular because people just wanted to drink. They weren't, they didn't care where they went with food, they just wanted to get drunk. And at that point, um, you know, it, it took 22 years for someone like my uncle to come along and say, hey, let's restart the industry. And uh, as crazy as it was, he restarted the industry and got Missouri relaunched with a couple other folks down in Herman. Uh, Mount Pleasant today is a 25,000 case winery. It uh, sells about two thirds of it out the front door to people who come out to visit us and we have approximately 50,000 visits a year. And we have a 50 acre vineyard uh, operation. And at the end of the day, it's a still a place where we grow stuff out of the ground turn it into really great wines and try and sell it to people who appreciate what we do. You know, most of the wineries are family owned and they obviously own their own vineyards. So the whole heartland of the United States, heartland being everything from the West Coast to the East Coast that's not specifically on the coast. Uh, Missouri is in, in the industry, Missouri is very highly regarded, but you don't see Missouri wines in other places because most of the wineries aren't big enough. To actually replace the flavor of the wood. So once I get this barrel out, I can then refill it and it picks up the flavor of the port that was in there. Uh -huh. So the uh, interesting thing about Augusta being the first Appalachian is, is that there's really no reason for it to be the first Appalachian other than we submitted our paperwork first and they were processed and order received. It, it recognizes us as a unique place on the planet on the United States that is unique for its climate, its wine history, its wine growing. Um, it just, it, it, it's the recognition. Uh, for me, it's, it's a great piece of marketing. Um, as a grape grower, it doesn't make a lot of sense because the actual grape growing region is beyond the actual political boundaries, but it's close enough to where we can really tell people this is why Augusta is great or why it's different and unique and why you should enjoy our wines as opposed to somebody else's wines. If, if you're telling me that you don't like Missouri wines, you're telling me that Missouri wines are bad or that Missouri, all Missouri wines are sweet, you're just wrong. And, and you know, you're not supposed to say, that, say it to people in business. And I say it all the time, say, you're wrong. Yeah, a lot of them didn't, uh, don't realize that, you know, wine was made in Missouri, they think it's cows and corn. Um, but once you get in the history part of it, then they start realizing, wow, I didn't know that, you know. With 130 wineries, don't judge them by one or two of them. And you know, I, I, I tell people the same thing in California. You, you, you can go to wineries in California and not be happy. You know, wine is one of these strange things where there's so many wine brands that if somebody says Napa Valley wines must be great, well, it doesn't mean that every single bottle of wine coming out of Napa Valley is great. And likewise, you know, every bottle of wine that comes out of Missouri isn't bad. But we can make a, 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 a Norton that tastes like a, I mean, a world, we can make world class wines from Norton, from Chambersan, Vignol. We, we have grapes that, that will compete with most wines of the world, but they aren't names that people are familiar with. You know, there is an image problem here. A lot of people are not familiar with Missouri wines. And we, you know, our wines are a little bit discounted because of it. You know, we're never gonna compete with California or France or anybody like that. Uh, we're just not. So I like to say that Missouri needs to stay together, strengthen numbers. We're competition amongst each other, but we also have to be together, strengthen numbers to get our word out there. When, when, when you have, when you sit down and taste a wine with the person who made it, with the person who grew it, you're probably gonna like the wine. For me, the joy isn't enjoying what 
I like out of our product. My, my joy is seeing other people enjoy what we've made here. And there's a craftsmanship and an artistry here in, in many of our products that's really fun to see what people like. And there's a lot of people who will come out here during the, a slower time and I'll go down to the cellar and pick out a, a small sample and ask them if they like it and uh, give me an honest opinion and tell me what you think. And when they, when they really like something, um, it's really, really worthwhile. I've been, a, I've been a judge at the Missouri competition for at least 30 years. And, and watching that develop has been a, just a treat. To, to, from the, the days where you would, you would taste 100 wines and 20 would be undrinkable. I mean, you couldn't even, now that, that you hardly ever have that now. When I go in my conference room and look out over the patio, and I just see a full patio of people enjoying their wine, having their picnics, just having fun, um, being with friends. And I look at those glasses of wine, you know, that they're enjoying. And it's like, you think, my crew and myself, we, we made those with our hands, you know, and look at that, they're just enjoying it. That's, that's just really satisfying. A lot of wineries don't have that idea of why, why am I making wine? you know, and it should be because you have to sell it. And the thing that I see is that in order to sell it, you have to be something special. And I think that the entire industry now is going through this process of realizing, hey, we need to be special. And that's why I think as soon as they figure out why they're special, I think you'll see Missouri wines growing again.